Test, test. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. If you could take your seats, we're going to get started uh, really soon. There are plenty of seats down below here, if you need seats. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I think we will go ahead and get started. My name is Carola Smith and I'm the um, chair of the Professional Development Advisory Committee. And uh, since this is our first time trying to pack a whole uh, day of in-service programming into a half day, uh, we have a very condensed format and I will try to keep us on track as much as possible. Uh, I would like to start out by recognizing our members of the Board of Trustees who have taken time out of their schedule to join us here. So we have President of the Board uh, of Trustees, Robert Miller here. Thank you very much. And welcome. And I see Dr. Peter Hasland here, so thank you for coming. Are there any other members of the Board of Trustees? Oh, I see Marsha Croninger. Thank you for coming and joining us. Anybody else? It's hard to see from up here. Well, welcome again. Um, I hope some of you had a chance to have some refreshments out there and to mingle with your colleagues. And I want to acknowledge uh, Jeff Green. Is Jeff here? Uh, yeah, Jeff Green. And our wonderful foundation for once again sponsoring the refreshments and underwriting the cost of that. So we are really grateful for that. I also want to uh, give a, a big thank you to the theater department and to Pam Lasker for allowing us to use uh, the Garvin here. Uh, I was given very strict instructions to make sure that none of the presenters disappear into this pit. So I will try to do my best to comply with that. Um, I also want to thank the behind-the-scenes staff that worked really hard to make today's uh, event uh, possible. The Office of Communications for putting together the awesome slideshow that you saw and for helping with uh, communications about the event. Um, our fabulous IT and facilities team who do most of the heavy list lifting for these events. Our afternoon workshop presenters, we have an awesome uh, variety of um, workshop topics this time and they all work very hard to put the, together these um, workshops. And then specifically our team of volunteers, Grace, Bea, um, Kirsten, Erin, uh, Yvette, um, let me see that, Kayleen. And um, last but not least, Cristina Garcia Otero, who spends an inordinate amount of time to put together this event. I was asked by the faculty lecturer um, committee to put a brief plug in for the faculty lecturer of the year award nominations, which are open now. As you came into the theater, you may have gotten a slip. Um, they look blue, and these are the forms where you can nominate a faculty colleague. And this is really one of the highest honors that we can bestow upon our colleagues. Uh, so please uh, take the time to nominate uh, one of our outstanding uh, our faculty colleagues. Uh, and uh, I want to mention that uh, it's not only uh, the faculty that can make these nominations, but anybody can nominate. So we uh, welcome nominations from staff members, from students, as well as from faculty. So as you leave, I think there will be another opportunity to pick up um, a form. So we will get started now, and we would like to start out our afternoon session with, um, by recognizing our True Mesh community as the original or, and traditional stewards of the land uh, upon which our beautiful campus is built. And so at this point, it's my honor to uh, welcome Dr. Annette Cordero to the stage, who will uh, say a few opening comments. Well, 
I would like to th first thank Carola for the additional degree, but um, I'm not a doctor, so. <laughs> but I appreciate the, the suggestion that I am. Um, so uh, I want to start with Haku, Haku Lia, Shumawish Tipa Shumawish, Annette Cordero Kakti, Kapari Shumolak, Ihichumashi Suktun, Kascho Kap Kamuli. Hello, hello everyone. Good, good health and well wishes to all of you. My name is Annette Cordero. My Chumash uh, ancestral village is Siuktun, the land on which Sa Santa Barbara City College sits. W I'm happy to welcome all of you here. As a direct descendant of the original occupants of Siuktun, the Chumash village site that's on which we are located, I'm honored to welcome you on behalf of my community, my ancestors, and all my relatives, the two-legged, four-legged, winged, and crawling. And so, and also on behalf of my relatives who grow from the earth and produce our nourishment and sustain our resources. I am blessed to still be inhabiting the land of my ancestors. I have always felt that the earth of this area is in my veins, that the breath of the air here is the breath that fills my lungs, that the rain, the wind, and the water are in my very DNA. And so I am especially humbled to be able to welcome all of you today. In our tradition, we ask the land to protect us and we ask her to watch over visitors as well, whether they are visiting for a short while or for a lifetime. And I ask this for all of us today. With that, I am going to invite Board of, the, of Trustees President uh, Robert Miller to recite the land acknowledgement in recognition of the original inhabitants of this land, on the land on which we, are, we will share and learn today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge the Chumash people, who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respect to the Chumash elders, past, present, and future who call this place the land that Santa Barbara City College sits upon their home. We are honored to be guests upon this land and are proud to continue their tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Chumash community for their stewardship And we thank you for that adjustment. <laughs> we thank the Chumash community for their stewardship and support, and we look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. It is also my honor and privilege today to introduce our new superintendent president. But I first want to acknowledge that we have faced difficult, and critically important challenges the past couple of years. We have financial challenges, we have enrollment challenges, we have campus climate challenges. They are un not unlike the challenges facing most community colleges in this state as well as in this nation. But we are not just any community college, we are Santa Barbara City College. We will continue to face our challenges with candor, humility, and concern for one another, but most importantly, for our students. We have high standards of excellence. We expect more of ourselves. And as we face our challenges, I know we have lost, not lost sight of our most important responsibility, helping each and every 
Santa Barbara City College student succeed. With these thoughts, about 10 months ago, we initiated the process to select a new permanent superintendent president. It is probably the most important responsibility of the Board of Trustees. A campus-wide selection committee with two community representatives conducted a nationwide search for the very best candidates. They reviewed dozens of applications, personally interviewed the top candidates, and presented the Board of Trustees with their finalists. The board then interviewed the finalists. I expected a very long afternoon of deliberations after we concluded our interviews, but we reached a unanimous decision with very little de deliberation. And that's because it was immediately obvious to each and every trustee that Dr. Gaswami was the right person for the job. Dr. Gaswami is uniquely qualified to lead one of the best community colleges in the nation to even greater levels of excellence. He has over three decades of experience in higher education in Missouri, California, Texas, and Arizona, serving in the classroom as well as in, in administration. Dr. Gaswami holds a master's degree in development economics from Boston University as well as a master's degree and doctorate in economics from Southern Methodist University. Most recently, he served as president of Metropolitan Community College Longview in Kansas City, Missouri. He officially started at Santa Barbara City College earlier this month, but I can personally attest to the fact that in reality, he has been on the job since the day he accepted our offer. I now present to you our new superintendent president, Dr. Upal Gaswami. Do I need to do anything to, for you to hear, to hear me? Yes. It happened automatically, all right. So good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here. Um, <clears throat> I've been here three weeks. And it looks like three weeks. It's not been three months, you know. So I've been I've been uh, staying uh, busy with uh, things that are in my uh, plate. Uh, but I want to begin by acknowledging the good work that all of you do, because the institution is made by people. Just like you mentioned about your ancestors and and how it has continued to nourish us, where we stand today as SBCC is based on the work that's been done over the last 50 to 70 years. So we stand on the legacy of those people who have contributed to SBCC. And I want to remind you that all of you are also contributing to SBCC right now. Your work, no matter what you do, is important. It's critical. It's valuable. I'll also remind you that my view of an organization is that an organization is an interconnected whole. We are interdependent we are interconnected. So our success and our failure is not of a group, not of a person, not of an entity, but our success and failure is as an institution. So, Trustee Miller, you kind of stole some of my thunder in terms of what some of the things I was gonna talk about. Um, so, but I wanna talk in bigger sense, because this is not the forum to talk about all the issues that we can talk about you know, in a more intimate setting. Uh, clearly, uh, people told me I was crazy to come to California. <laughs> Do you know why? Be <laughs> well, the thing is, our funding per student is 5,500, 5,800, okay. Where I came from MCC, we were at 10,000. And we considered ourselves poor and didn't give raise for two years. I have worked at institutions where per student funding is $13,000 per student. So I know the incredible stress by which community colleges operate in California. It's a big challenge. 
So we will talk about budgets later on. I just wanted to give you a context that, you know, that why is it happening? Every community college in California is having the problem. But what keeps me up as a, as, a, as a leader is whether we as an institution are doing and evolving to meet the evolving needs of our students due to changing demographics. Students are changing. Students who were here in the in, in 70s are different in the 80s, 90s. But we stay as employees in the institution for, for a long period of time. So if, if, not if, when our mission is that we are here for the success of each student, it becomes our obligation to look internally to see are we changing for our students as needed. And that's something you'll keep hearing repeatedly from me, that long-term success of SBCC depends on responding to that ultimate challenge. And let me tell you, you have a good track record of doing that. So that's why I'm here, to help you go to the next, next stage. Uh, SBCC is a jewel of a community college in California. Don't let the last two years' experience cloud the fact that it is a great institution and the other institution look up to it. So my take on what you went through over the last couple of years is a little bit different. Race, gender, equity, inclusion, diversity, those are issues at all institutions. It's there at all institutions. We had the courage to bring it up. So give yourself an applause for bringing up something that others are afraid to bring it up. But the greatness of institution is not just you identify that something is not right. Greatness of institution is how you come together after you've identified something, how to solve those issues. And as I was visiting the social science division this morning, I told them that I want to tell the rest of the world, you've been hearing about all these race issues or whatever it is, give us credit for bringing something up. And now watch us solve it. And in two years from now, you'll come here to copy things that we do to address that. So, Here's where I am. If you look all over the world, social structures, institutional processes evolve to support and help the dominant class. No matter what, if you go to Nigeria, where you know, everybody is Af no, African American, Nigerian, they'll still have issues because of whether the Yoruba tribe is dominating the Hausa tribe, where the system has now evolved to, okay. So it's a given that any structure that you have is going to support the dominant paradigm. Now when, when that dynamic changes because of demographics, we need to face up as to how we're going to change that paradigm. And the funny thing is, social structures have a, have a great ability to be self-sustaining. It has a self-perpetuating element to it. So I can stand here and tell, even though I was not part of the dominant class, Amut Polke Goswami, and I help sustain this status quo with the work that I have done over the last 15, 20 years. But at the same time, I can also tell you, I'm with Paul K. Goswami, who is keenly aware of how these things have disparate, uh, disparate impacts 
on students and individuals. And I worked hard to put things in place to make things happen. So all of these points to me that we need a systemic, systemic solution. But the thing about systemic solution is that you cannot have systemic solution without the members of the system being part of the solution. If you look at the beauty of a flock of birds flying in, in, in synchrony or a school of fish, it is because every member of that group is doing their part. So I can tell you, I, I can stand here and make a commitment to you that it's a given that over the next few years we will diversify our workforce. It's a given. It's a given that we will tighten up our policy and procedures regarding all the issues we're going to talk about, that we have talked about. It's a given that we will put in place things that you have complained about, that we, when we complain, it goes into black hole. We will improve that process, and you'll hear something about that very, very, very soon. I can make you a commitment that me, not only me, my, my team, that we will work and we will demonstrate through our actions, not just our words, that you can trust us and that we are transparent. I cannot guarantee you're going to like everything that we do, but you can certainly be assured that we will take full advantage of the participatory governance process. My commitment to that is 100%. You have already done a lot of work. The umbrella that, that, that provides the umbrella by which we're going to move forward. So the training programs and all of those things that you're doing, excellent work. But I will say here that that's not enough because that provides an umbrella. That is more of an awareness campaign. We have to immediately bring it down to impacting our students who are here this semester and next semester. So the next level of work that we have to do is to translate some of those work on equity and inclusion not at the 10,000 feet level, not at the 5,000 feet level, but at the level at which are, no, that we to impact our students. Because as I told you in my uh, introduction uh, when I came here first time, don't forget that every student is somebody's son, somebody's daughter, somebody's dad, somebody's mom. They are not dispensable. And, and our, our commitment as an institution is that we're committed to the success of every student. So I will need your help. So let me share quickly. Um, you're telling me, giving me the eye, you know. A um, couple of uh, uh, thoughts. Uh, what is in welcoming environment? Where do you feel safe? So if you reflect Take politics out, reflect on you as an individual, and transport yourself to an unknown city somewhere. You're walking down the street, and you get mugged. And you're, you're hurt, you're down on the floor on the sidewalk. What do you think about the city, in terms of whether it's a state safe city or unsafe city, will not be determined by whether you got mugged, but we will be determined on how people reacted after you got mugged. So there was an old 60 Minutes video that planted a small child in a crosswalk in 40, 42nd Street. I'm lost, help me, this girl. And took pictures and recorded it and for half an hour, people were going by doing nothing. People were crying when they saw the 60 Minutes video. 
So when, when that happens to that in a city, you have one opinion of the city versus another city where you got mugged. And immediately 40 people came by and said, I'm going to take you over there. Here's a cup of coffee. Here's a Band-Aid, whatever it is. All of it. Your, your opinion of that city is going to be different. You feel safe when you know others are not looking out for you. Because you cannot eliminate bad things from happening. It's going to happen everywhere. We are in a free society. So people will write stuff in the, in the cafeteria walls, bathroom walls, whatever it is. But we have to evolve as an institution. And I'm thankful that my last institution did. That when those things happen, people do not take it as a confirmation of, yeah, that, that shows exactly who we are. Rather, they say, that's not who we are. That's some not doing it. So we have to grow as an institution, and we don't get there in one day. Because that's where we all have a role to play. So one of my first requests to you is going to be that we adopted our mission statements. We need to have a good conversation about our values. And specifically values, not only just values, but we want, we will have to stand up for our values. Freedom doesn't come cheap. We need to get to the point where somebody is saying something untoward to a colleague of yours, if it is safe. You need to take upon yourself to say, but Robert, that's uncalled for. That's not what SBCC is. And when that happens, the person who was a victim feels less of a victim, feels supported. You can always file a complaint, and then we can do something, whatever it is, but that'll be two weeks later, three weeks later. So I'm just trying to give you an insight about how I'm thinking about these things to make a, make a society that is inclusive and holistic and, and taking care. So we have to take care of each other. Final point, and I was as guilty as the person that I'm going to describe. I have seen in academic institutions our strengths work against us. Our strengths are to be critical, examine, question, dissect it, if possible, destroy the other argument with a great fun in destroying somebody else's argument. Your thesis is no good. No, here it is. Robert, you make no sense. What school did you go to? Okay. But if you don't watch it, it can, it can devolve very quickly into not discussing the idea, but attacking the individual. That is when your strength is working against you. We have to watch out for that. Because that is precisely the environment we don't want to create. So there is an art to be disagreeable, Yet people felt you're agreeable. And that's one of the challenges I think most of you in the classroom face, how to introduce difficult topics in the classroom. Because at that point, you lose all control of what, what people are going to say, what they're going to say, and then you have to worry about you know, how I manage what that happens. But we will discuss that at some other time. You know. I think I talked to Ms. Imhoff about that. Uh, no. uh, so I'll conclude by just letting you know on some of the things that I'm thinking about. And I'll discuss that at some other forums. Um, if you're 
focused on students and success of each student, we have to look at all our processes from the perspective of, of students and perspective of employees. So we will put through a number of our business processes through an analysis to see whether we need to tweak our processes to make them more friendly. Number two, my eyes are fresh, so I see when paint is peeling or the sidewalk is broken or the building is crumbling, we need to rebuild a lot of the things in this campus. So consideration of a bond. And when it comes to a bond, you all will have to become ambassadors for the bond. Success and failure of the bond depends on how people hear from you about the bonds. I already told you I'm looking at the processes to, uh, as to how to evaluate complaints and things like that, so we'll roll out a process pretty soon. I'm also working with Hong, he's somewhere I guess, uh, to do a kind of a web page. And maybe it's going to look like, that won't probably be the name, but inside sbcc.edu, let's say. And if you go there, it's going to link you to everything that's happening in our governance structure. You'll see agendas, you'll see minutes, you'll see the handouts, all that stuff. So nobody can claim, I have no idea what's going on, because you know, if you're interested in whatever happened in the facilities committee, you go to there, click on facilities, you will find it right there. So we're, we're trying to work that process. I've also shared some ideas with, with, our, with our folks doing the uh, guided pathway and the program reviews. And remember, at some point in time, I was a faculty member. So I know what processes are make work and, and what processes are productive. And my intent is to make sure that the processes that we have work for you. So I'll, I'll provide some suggestions and we'll work through the, those processes. And then the faculty group is gonna say whether or not we want to tweak it this way, that way, whatever it is, and, and redesign our program review process. But my goal is that we end up with a program review process, whereas a department, you can, done, you can be done with your program review in two hours. And, and, and I have done it. And we have done it at two institutions. And not the same template. So you are free to pick kind of templates and criteria and all of those things, metrics, but the concept, conceptual blocks of how you end up doing it is, is pretty similar. So with that, I am thankful to be here. I'm delighted to be here. I thank the board for hiring me and um, hope you keep me for a while. <laughs> and uh, please invite me to come and visit you in your uh, uh, you know, meetings and offices because uh, the conversation that we need to have cannot be from a stage because it's a one-way conversation. Conversations we need to have has to be you know, interactive. So find smaller groups, invite me, I'll come. You can see that I'm not shy about speaking my mind. And I hope you will also speak your mind to me. Thank you, have a great semester. Thank you so much, Dr. Goswami, for your introductory remarks. At this point, it is my pleasure to introduce Executive Vice President Dr. Pamela Ralston, who will talk a little bit about our ongoing work uh, within accreditation and other important uh, initiatives. Pamela? I have a feeling all you'll remember this afternoon is the daydream of a two-hour program review. 
So thank you very much, Dr. Goswami, staff, faculty, members of the Board of Trustees who are here with you today, here with us today. I want to talk a little bit about um, updates on things that I brought to you last fall when we were first coming together. So we've been working um, across the institution, but particularly in educational programs, working on it, completing our institutional self-evaluation for accreditation, updating our mission, strategic directions, and integrating our planning with a focus on equitable outcomes for students and improving our participatory governance. As Dr. Goswami shared this week in an email, the Board of Trustees has voted to approve our newly revised mission statement. Thank you to all of you who worked last fall to offer suggestions and input on the revision of that mission statement. Our new mission reads, Santa Barbara City College welcomes all students. The college provides a diverse learning environment and opportunities for students to enrich their lives, advance their careers, complete certificates, earn associate degrees, and transfer to four-year institutions. The college is committed to fostering an equitable, inclusive, respectful, participatory, supportive community dedicated to the success of every student. We're working on our institutional self-evaluation and that really requires us and provides us the opportunity to dig deeply into the work that we do. As we have been researching and documenting um, how we meet standards for the Accreditation Commission, we're diving into our policies, our procedures, and our practices to determine if we actually meet those standards and how to make improvements where we determine that we can do better. We're deeply invol involved in this accreditation evaluation. The teams of people working on the standards, if you've been working on a standard, could you let us know? Yeah. Wow, it's just a huge swath of you, just amazing. We've been working to document how effectively we meet the expectations for an effective college. Our work has shown where we meet and where we exceed those standards, but also where we have gaps. Those gaps provide us an opportunity to make improvements where we determine that we could do better. In accreditation language, this is talked about as improvement plans, those areas where we actually make a significant and documented commitment to the work that we can do better. And colleges find areas inside our work where we can improve our institutional effectiveness. We demonstrate the linkages between our evaluation and the institutional planning, decision making, resource allocation, and continuous improvement. That's that massive cycle that's so crucial to the work that we do. Our improvement plan should be integrated into our overall institutional evaluation and planning processes for implementation and follow up. The evaluation process supports our college's work as we plan to improve in these cycles and these processes. And as we work through that, we have a series of areas that we know have been a struggle for us. So as a, a research team, we've really realized the areas where we're struggling, and those two standards require deeper improvement in our planning. And this spring, we'll be working to lay out um, planning documents that help us move forward on those. The first of these is, this is a seriously difficult angle for someone with glasses. Um, the first of these falls under standard 1B, which is assuring our academic quality and institutional effectiveness. If you think about it, that is all of the work that we do to test for our capacity at any given point. In an accreditation cycle, from the moment that we start instructing a class to the support services we provide to any of the administrative support that happens on our campus, to the effectiveness of all the parts of an institution that work together. So on standard 1B5 and 1B6, these are areas where we realize that we have a lot more work to do to be our most effective self, to really rise up. These are the areas where we assess our accomplishment of our mission, that goal that we've set that we've just revised that's fresh for us, and that's working at the level of program review and evaluation, our goals and objectives, our student learning outcomes, what students are actually achieving in the instruction that we provide, and student achievement, that place where we actually test for grades and success. Our qualitative and quantitative data get disaggregated for analysis in this process, and we understand that that impacts our modes of delivery. Standard 1B6 is our processes for decision making and the resulting decisions that are documented and widely 
communicated across our campus. We know that that's been a struggle. And when we think about the last two years in particular, but if we scan back further, this is an area of challenge for any institution the size of which we are. But it's particularly important in a world where we need to be more nimble in our response mechanisms. So when that works, everyone feels like they're moving along quickly together. When that doesn't work, that feels like a break in communication, a top-down approach. Things feel like they don't move quickly enough. Taken together, these two standards encompass the need for information, policy, process, and model review and update. This is the work of our effective decision making when it's working, and when it's not, we notice. The cycle of assessment and analysis, improvement planning, recommendations, decision making, resource allocation, dry accreditation sounding words that are actually the very core of the work that we do. What we want to achieve because we know we're not meeting standards, how we plan together and work for that, how we give resources and afford funding to be able to make that change, and how we test for it after we implement it. Did it work? This is the work that we have in front of us. We have a board policy, 2510. It describes the picture of how our district should be approaching governance and decision making. That policy explains the district's approach to governance and decision making is based upon a partnership among the board of trustees, our employees, our students. The constituent groups participate in governance and decision making appropriate in the scope of their roles across the district and are united by a collective shared vision that advances the mission of the institution. We know that when we're not working well together, that's frayed. It's difficult to uphold that collective vision. It's difficult to understand the decision-making process. And so this spring, we need to work together to re-envision how that works effectively. Working to achieve our important mission for students and our community requires us to dig in deep to how we work together. We have a variety of data that show where we've been less than effective in our processes of decision making and communication that range from the anecdotal experiences that we have to the climate survey that we took last spring. How we foster the partnership between our constituent groups and how we promote the collective and shared vision described in that board policy, that needs to be revisited. We see the concerns in the diversity, equity, and inclusion survey, in individual meetings, and in the voicing of a need for greater transparency, collaboration, respect, and accountability here at Santa Barbara City College. We are a large community in and of ourselves, and we need to revisit how we plan for, structure, and communicate our work together. Which takes us to standard four, which is the governance, the participation piece of accreditation. Standard 4A5 talks to us about um, this system that we need to have between our board and institutional governance and how we ensure the appropriate consideration of the relevant perspectives decision, and to make decision making aligned with expertise and responsibility and timely action on our institutional plans, policies, curricular change, and other key considerations. Standard 4A covers the roles and processes in decision making and provides standards that we can measure our effectiveness against. The results of that climate survey from last spring document areas quite clearly where we need to work together. In our responses, we identified areas of serious concern related to engagement, trust, and safety. Many of us reported experiencing inequities and exclusions based on our personal characteristics or because of bias and prejudice of others, or maybe some combination of all of these. Feelings of disengagement and exclusion from college decision-making processes are evident on top of that. Our improvement planning for standards one and four need to include examining our existing committee structures and our membership, our methods of communication, and our strategies for recruiting new voices and ideas, and our pathways for fostering innovation and institutional effectiveness. Ultimately, these plans will need to address deepening understanding of governance goals, decision-making processes, and committee structures, and doing so through an equity lens. Improving our governance structures and processes need to increase our engagement and effectiveness, not bog us down with more committee work and time away from the work that we do for students. We need to create accessible, useful guides and training to support our work together, and we need to work in a student-centered model where those outcomes are designed to really impact the experience of students here. 
While our goal is to create a more streamlined and effective decision-making apparatus, our hope is that having clear and transparent decision-making processes can help employees develop a stronger trust and engagement with our college, laying the groundwork for a more inclusive and positive culture. As we work together over the course of this spring, we'll be inviting you to work with us as we lay out plans to make these changes. And in accreditation, an improvement plan will give us opportunity to work this year, next year, and following years. We'll update in our midterm report. And at the end of this cycle, we will be a much stronger, more cohesive college at the level of our policy and structural pieces. We have much to do with our relationship work and the work that we do together to re-embrace a strong foundation can help to do that. I thank you for thinking about this in terms of the work that we do to document our successes and our strengths, and I appreciate your coming effort to help us work on these areas of improvement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ralston. At this point, I would like to ask um, Academic Senate President Patricia Stark to the podium, and she will provide an update on behalf of the shared governance groups on the group's responses to the climate survey issues that were voiced. So, Patricia? <laughs> You can't see the slides when you stand here, so let's see, okay. Um, hello, um, for those, I know many of you, for those who do not, who I do not know, I'm Patricia Stark, and for the last 20 months, I've had the honor of being um, our Academic Senate President. I'm here today because our Professional Development Advisory Committee, um, which is the group that coordinated this afternoon's in-service event, asked representatives from the four shared governance groups to update the campus on our responses to the climate survey that we took in the spring and then reviewed the, sur and then reviewed the results and a series of focus groups in the, in the fall. Um, we agreed to do that and then we wavered because the truth is that with shifting leadership and with the sheer immensity of the job ahead, we had trouble describing what our response has been exactly, um, describing exactly what we had accomplished, although I want to thank Dr. Ralston for detailing just that in her um, comments about accreditation, where I think most of this work has, has been centered. Um, and work that many of um, people from all of our groups have, have contributed to. So please understand that people are responding and we need to honor the work of the people that have come before us. Uh, managers, for example, held a day-long retreat to address one of the common themes in the survey, the lack of trust in senior leadership that was um, prevalent in the survey responses. The classified staff has been working with our accreditation team, prompting us to seriously examine the way decisions are made at Santa Barbara City College and how people are left out of decisions that have a direct impact on their professional lives. This was another major finding of the survey. The Academic Senate and its representatives on campus-wide committees um, working with other, with people from our other groups, have re-examined college policies and processes and procedures that worked um, to that, and, and we worked to revise our foundational documents to elevate the importance of equity and inclusion. We helped to rewrite the mission statement. We worked on strategic directions um, and all and other foundational documents to. Um, make sure that really critical language was added to show the importance of equity inclusion. But this needs to be measured against the fact that um, the Academic Senate spent 90 minutes on Wednesday debating the accuracy and relevance of the survey results while sim simultaneously voicing frustration with past administrative decisions that upended faculty-led initiatives and inadequate campus responses to past racist incidents. So all of this points, I would argue, to how unsettled we as a campus still are in these critical conversations. 
So anyway, we as a governance group, we representatives of the governance groups, decided not to detail a series of meetings or workshops or a long laundry list of incremental changes. Instead, we decided to focus on a set of values that we together articulated in a series of focus groups facilitated in October by Dr. Debbie DeThomas and Dr. Siria Martinez. We picked this approach honestly because it's challenging to make any public statement about equity, diversion, and inclusion without generating more tension and divisiveness. More important though, we hope to present an honest, accurate, and aspirational vision of who we are at Santa Barbara City College and who we want to be as a college. We hope these shared values will help us chart the path forward. And we hope to gain everyone's support Peter, Robert, Marsha, Dr. Gazwami, um, in helping us to uphold these values. And finally, I agreed to be the spokesperson for our work group, which comprised representatives from the Managers Group, the Advancing Leadership Association, the California School Employees Group, Classified, Cl Cl Classified Consultation Council, the Academic Senate, and the Associated Student Government. Um, our student, gover our student govern government Sorry, President Alexandra Montez Dioka will be up after me to talk about the student response. So what follows now is the presentation that we all agreed to share with you. These opening comments were entirely my own. Transparency, number one. We asked for greater transparency in communicating and allocating funds and in all of our decision making processes. Accountability. We want to do better educating and explaining the roles of our constituency groups and the role of the Board of Trustees. And conversely, or perhaps not so conversely, representatives at these groups report that people campus-wide don't understand what we do and um, what are our respective areas of responsibility. And I'm quoting from the summary report now. SBCC needs to clearly define and develop a shared understanding of the roles of the various constituency groups, specifically of the Academic Senate's rights and responsibilities and those that are delegated to management. Having this understanding of the multiple layers of accountability will help SBCC enforce accountability and will lead to increased trust, respect, and institutional as well as personal effectiveness. I should note that this is also, Dr. Ralston alluded to it, um, the number one finding to come out of our year-long self-study through our accreditation report. Professional development. We are asking for professional development opportunities be available to all SBCC employees. This will lead to improved interpersonal reactions, better service for our students, a more effective workplace, and an improved campus climate. A culture of respect. This value was added by our work group, and I'm now going to paraphrase the guidelines for dialogue and conversation adopted by the State Academic Senate. We want to acknowledge each other's experiences. We do not want to devalue people for their experiences, lack of experiences, or differences in interpretation of those experiences. We hope to trust that others are doing the best they can. We will not we will try not to freeze people in time, but leave space for everyone to learn and change through our interactions with one another. Expanded opportunities and expanded opportunities and collaboration. Closely related, we ask to develop transparent processes that allow all constituency groups to participate as appropriate in college-wide meetings, dialogue, governance, and professional development activities. Rebuilding trust. Every group at SBCC in the survey reported feeling undervalued and expre expressed a lack of trust with other groups. We even expressed a lack of trust um, within our own groups. So as we work on the values listed above, we hope that we can begin to rebuild trust in each other over time. Spaces of healing. This was actually the first value listed in the inclusions in the um, focus groups. But our work in intentionally put the item last because we believe that action must precede healing. 
We cannot heal if we continue to exclude, to make our colleagues feel less than, or to cause harm. And what steps we need to create spaces for healing at SBCC is really the critical question before us now. So summing up, we are attempting nothing less here than to rebuild our community. And what we're trying to do is very hard. We don't have all the answers, but we do have a roadmap as these values provide that we've already claimed for ourselves. This is a beginning. Now we have to decide as a college how we want to live up to these values. And then we all need to commit ourselves to doing this work. And these are the members of our work group who are committed to these values and to this work. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patricia. At this point, it is my absolute honor to ask Alexandra Montes de Oca to the podium. And Alexandra, I cannot help myself, but I have to put you on the spot. Alexandra shared with me last week that she works three jobs. She is the president of the Associate Student Government and also involved in several other student organizations. And she came here from her job and told me that she only has a few minutes and has to go back to work. So I saw... I'm so in awe of all you do, and I really thank you for your leadership. So let's give a warm welcome to Alexandra. Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Um, I would like to share a little personal story. Um, I have been an undergraduate student for six years. When I attended Westmont College six years ago, I very quickly knew what loneliness felt like. True loneliness to the point of convincing yourself that you are unwanted because friendships with students didn't last longer than one year. I felt so radically different and cast out from everyone around me that I was convinced I would never live past 20 years old. For me, it took only one professor to keep me from giving up on everything. He was the only one I could trust to look at me unjudgmentally and truly listen to me, giving me the time and space to figure out my way in the world amongst a sea of students who all eventually shut me out. After leaving Westmont, I left everything behind and started off completely fresh including my grades. I went through three years of education at Westmont only to discover that hardly anything transferred. This was the hardest time in my life. For months, I mourned over the three years of my life being wasted. I truly started off new, but I knew what I was doing. From those experiences, I gained wisdom. This is why I'm so motivated on campus and in my studies. I experienced the worst of life. I never want any student to feel the exact same way I did all those years ago. I came this far, I'm not stopping now. But this is only my story. For most other students, this is their first year of college. They will go through their own personal challenges on this next journey in their lives. And some of those challenges occur in the classroom. Not every student sees challenges the same way. What I have noticed after three years of being a full-time student at SBCC, when a peer of mine is challenged in the class to the point where that student is truly lost, confused, or frustrated, they drop the class. And when a student truly does not feel like they belong on campus because they feel so radically different, they leave the school. For us students, the answer is simple, to just leave. So what can you as leaders, professors, educators, and mentors do about it? Listen to each student. Welcome them in. Make time for them. 
You are the ones that can directly see when they are struggling. Have the courage to check in with them. They may need just one person to keep them from giving up on everything. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandra, for those powerful words. And now you can go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> so last, we have uh, a presentation from Eric Fricky. Is Eric here? Um, I hope so. Uh, oh, there you are. <laughs> Sorry, but Eric Fricke, uh, Director of Security, will give a brief emer emergency preparedness presentation. And if you would like more information uh, or a more in-depth presentation, we also have an afternoon workshop on that topic. So, Eric, thank you so much. Good afternoon. Okay, it's solid. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, allowing us to present on emergency services. This is uh, very great to be able to share this information with everybody at one time. I'm going to talk about Alert You. I hope that everybody has signed up for Alert You. I encourage you to do so. And when you're in your classrooms, encourage your students to sign up for it as well. This is a very useful uh, tool to be able to send out emergency information right away. And not only will it be used for big emergencies, but also we use it for our, uh, when we had our mudslides, the fires, just in a way to communicate that we're closing campus. So this is not gonna be used to advertise bake sales or you know book sales, any of that stuff. It's gonna be used just for emergencies. Now, I, I realize that you're probably not going to uh, remember that text. So the easiest way to get to that information so you can sign up is go to any page on our website. And at the very bottom, there's a list of links. And one of those links is emergency. You click on emergency, it takes you to our emergency page. And then from there, go to menu. And then there's a little scroll down button to uh, go to alert you, and that's where you can find this information. Security is, or campus safety, is the primary responders to emergencies on campus. And if you do need to call 911, please call us as well. So the first call 911, and then call campus safety, because we want to be aware that there's an emergency going on. That way we can meet the paramedics or the police, fire, and help direct them to the location. When you call 911 from a campus phone, you can call 911 or you can hit 9 and then 911. Either one will work. Also encourage you to put our emergency, self, uh, our emergency phone number in your phone. That way you could be anywhere on campus and you see something going on, you don't have to run to try to find a, a phone in a classroom or one of those uh, tall emergency phones that we have around. You have that number in your phone and then just call us directly. We answer it on our radio. You tell us where you are, what's going on, and then we will be right there. Not only do you want to be, uh, not only do you want to know how to lock your classroom, but also how many doors are in your classroom. You may switch from a small classroom that has one single door to a large lecture hall that has multiple doors. Do those doors open out into the hallway? Do they open into the classroom? That could be useful information in case you need to barricade those doors. Also, where do those doors lead to? Does one door just lead into a dead-end area where there's not a lot of room to escape? 
or is there another door lead you down to a stairway that leads you out of the building to where you can get to safety? Know your building, know your classroom. Every classroom has a uh, emergency phone. It's right at the front and it has three different uh, pre-select numbers. First one is 911, next is campus safety, and then after that is uh, the help desk in case you have any problems with your computer. <laughs> I'll get a little bit uh, more in depth on locking your classroom, but run, hide, and fight. Same thing, go to our emergency website and you can watch a list of videos when you scroll down the menu. And one of those uh, videos is Run, Hide, and Fight that talks about how you either run or how do you secure yourself or how you, if you have to, fight back. There is another very good video on how to handle a situation in the classroom itself and how to get your uh, students all together and be able to take on in case a bad person does come into your room. Earthquakes, we all know what to do with an earthquake. Wait till the shaking stops, get under something that's uh, secure to keep from uh, being hit by anything above you. Most people get injured in an earthquake when they run out of the building and they have debris falling off the roof and hitting them on the head. We most frequently get fire alarms. Everybody, I think, has gone through a fire alarm. And please don't think that it is just another mistake. Um, dust gets caught up in those uh, uh, sensors. They trip easy. They're highly sensitive for a very good reason because they want to be able to detect smoke early, but they do lead to false alarms. When you uh, do have to evacuate, you want to get out in an orderly fashion and get your students to an actual evacuation zone. And so again, the emergency website will give you information on where those emergency evacuation zones are. Run, hide, and fight. A lot of you probably have gone to Lieutenant Hill's active shooter presentation. He talks about run, hide, and fight as a tool or a set of tools in a toolbox that you can interchange at any time. So if you start off with one tool and you realize that that's not working and you gotta change, that's when you, you have your options. So if you are able to run away from the danger, that is the best thing that you can do. But keep in mind, you gotta know where the danger is and where you're going. And be careful because if you run right out of a building, you could put yourself into harm's way so if in doubt, that's where you want to secure yourself in the classroom or in your office and wait until the all clear sign comes from either campus safety or from law enforcement. If you have to fight back, fight back. Studies have shown that just by hiding underneath a desk and hoping that nothing bad will happen to you does not bode well. So you, as one uh, presenter put it, um, he's going to make that person's, he's going to be that person's worst nightmare, meaning that he's going to do everything he can to take that person out. Don't worry if you're going to hurt them. They're here to cause you harm. You're going to give it back to them tenfold. Everyone knows that we have electronic locks on campus. Every classroom has an electronic lock, and you're going to see that white washer around. If you ever see the white washer missing from your classroom, please let us know. It just fell off. We had to glue those on as a, uh, as a measure to keep those classrooms from being accidentally locked as students push their way out. So that white washer, uh, it kind of highlights the button that you need to uh, push. And, uh, and if you have an emergency, use it. There's a difference between a lockdown on your own, you personally going to that uh, button and pushing it, locking it, and a campus-wide lockdown. When you push that button, you're locking that door and that door only. And if you realize, oh, it's just a mistake, or you heard something going on outside, and 
you think it's something really bad, and then you realize, oh, it's some drama students. They're rehearsing. <laughs> you realize, I don't need to uh, lock that door. I can push that button and unlock it, and now the door's back to normal function. Versus doing a campus-wide lockdown where security gets the report that something bad is happening. We go to our computer in the office with a couple clicks. We lock down the whole campus. And then you can't push that button to unlock it. It's locked. And your cards are not going to work in opening up that door. The reason why is we didn't want to take the chance that someone bad realizing that all I have to do is get a maintenance or a securities card, and then they can gain access into any door. So we, we eliminated that. We understand that there are, uh, that could be problematic. In case we do a lockdown, you're outside that class, you're trying to get into that classroom, you can't. It's a tough decision that we had to make, but we made it for what we thought was the benefit for the masses, and knowing that there could be people that can't get back into the classroom and get to safety. So if you ever get that alert that tells you that uh, we're doing a lockdown, then realize that you're not going to be able to get into a building or get into that classroom. You've got to find another way to get out. The doors are only as secure as they are closed. So you can push that button, but if that door is not completely shut, it's not secure. Those are a list of our AEDs. Another thing about being prepared for the classroom or for the building is know where your AEDs are. And that information is listed on our webpage. And we have an AED in every single building and in most buildings, every single floor. So that was a, a real effort uh, to get that emergency tool in every building so that people have access to it. Don't worry about if you haven't received the training on an AED. You just yank that box open. The alarm is going to go off. Don't worry. That's designed so that it attracts attention, letting people know that there is an emergency. And when you open up the AED itself, automatic voice is going to come on. It's going to uh, tell you exactly what to do. And you cannot harm somebody with that AED. It is designed so that it will only deliver a shock when a person actually needs that shock. And it will talk you through on exactly where to place it and when to press that button. Again, the uh, evacuation zones. West Campus, very easy. you got this grass lawn, big grass lawn you can run out to and, and be away from a building. East Campus, not as easy. We have multiple uh, evacuation zones, so you have to uh, pick uh, which is going to be the closest and the safest to go to. So if you can't get to one evacuation zone, then you pick the next one. You are a disaster service worker. In the case of an emergency, we don't want you to go running off campus for a couple reasons. One is that we may need your help. The other reason is that if there is a real emergency, let's say a bad earthquake, roads and bridges, freeways are down, how are you going to get out of, um, out of the campus and to your home? So it's better to be stuck on campus than be stuck in, on the road, on the freeway, and not being able to go anywhere. So stay on campus. That way you have the resources on campus and you would be able to provide help if we need it. Only the president or the uh, person designated uh, under him can make that decision to tell you to leave campus. And so that would be an emergency alert that we would send out that would give you that okay to leave and, uh, or to stay on campus to lend support. Again, even if it's a small little emergency, like we've had a power line coming down, and we said campus is closed, even though the neighborhood's not impacted, but can you imagine all the students and all the instructors getting in their cars and trying to drive away 
uh, makes quite a, um, quite a mess on the road. So we've learned from that, and so we'll stage the evacuations so that we want, we'll let you know, okay, all of East Campus leave, and then all of West Campus leave. So we realize that in emergency, even our uh, roads getting, our uh, driveways getting out onto Cliff Drive can be very impacted. We have safety marshals designated for every building, for every floor, and we try to have backup safety marshals. They're primarily classified staff who are here throughout the day, and their role is to assist everyone else in leaving the, the building as they are leaving themselves. They are not to put themselves in the harm's way, and in fact, they will only be assisting when we have a situation such as an earthquake or a fire alarm going off, they will not be assisting if we have an active shooter because they are to take the same protocol as everybody else, run, hide, or fight. So they, if they, if they have time, will put on emergency vests. They have a, a bag that they can carry out that will help assist people and once you get to the evacuation zone, take role in trying to make sure that they can uh, account for everybody. And as instructors, try to account for your students, but we know that's going to be next to impossible because once students get out of, the, out of their classroom, who knows where they're going, to the beach or you know, going home, um, you probably won't see them around. And this last uh, slide, being prepared at home, we want you to keep that in mind because if you have something prepared at home, whether it's information that all your family can follow, such as uh, phone numbers, uh, places to go, um, relatives, family that can pick up the kids from daycare, if you have that covered, then you don't need to worry about getting home. They're, they're already taken care of. So being prepared at home, will lend you peace of mind while you're here on campus. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this is OK. Um, so this concludes our general session. And next up, we have our workshops. Here you have a list of the workshops. For those of you who have not signed up for a workshop yet, feel free to go to the location and see whether there is still space available. Some of them are fully um, booked. Um, but uh, we have an awesome list of um, topics. So I hope you find something that is of interest to you. Thank you so much for coming. Mm -hmm.